Michael Dunn didn't like the loud music coming from the car park next to him, and when the teens in the vehicle didn't comply with his request for them to turn it down, he decided to teach them exactly who was boss. This is Monsters. When I was 16 years old, I played bass guitar in a punk band. That summer, for my older sister's birthday, we decided to play in our living room for a birthday party. My sister and I got along pretty well at the time, and our friends ran in the same circles, so she had some friends over and I had some friends over, and we played some music. Now, we talked to the neighbors on each side of our house first, and they both said it was fine. It wasn't a late-night party, probably closer to late afternoon, early evening. Plus, we didn't live in a typical suburban neighborhood like you'd see today, where houses are crammed together and you can practically reach out your window and shake your neighbor's hand. We lived in an old house in a more rural area, where houses had at least a half acre or more. Our house was set to the back of the property, where both of our neighbor's houses were set to the front of the property, so we had a little bit of room between us on each side. Well, we set up our tiny amps and I strapped on my bass that I'd purchased on sale from Sears, and we began to play. Not long after, a random man walked into our front door and started yelling at us. We had never seen this man before in our lives, but he was upset about the noise. He yelled at us that it was so loud that he couldn't even hear his TV. I told him it was my sister's birthday and we were going to play for about half an hour and we'd be done. He said, quote, I don't care about your sister's birthday, end quote. To which I responded, quote, well, I don't care about your TV, end quote. This enraged the man to the point of him rushing me and grabbing the neck of my base. We struggled for a few seconds, and I think everyone was frozen out of shock, but when he reached over and smacked me in the head, everybody snapped out of it and grabbed the guy. They dragged him out of the house and tossed him off the front porch. My mother was upstairs in her bedroom reading while we were having our party, but she heard the music stop in some sort of commotion, so she came downstairs and argued with the man in our front lawn. He eventually walked away, and someone at the party called the police. When they arrived, they took the complaint and they went and talked to the man. Despite him having attacked a minor, nothing was done about it. It turned out that the guy didn't even live that close. He was a couple of houses down and then on the corner of the adjacent street. A kid I went to school with lived across the street from him, and he said that the cops were at his house regularly because of domestic disturbances. The people who lived closest to us told us later that they could definitely hear us, but they were watching TV and didn't have a problem hearing it. It seemed that the guy just had anger issues. He moved a few years later, and I like to think it was because his house became a target for frequent eggings, but who knows. After working on this story, it makes me feel lucky that the asshole didn't come back to my house and shoot up the joint. Michael Dunn was 45 years old in 2012 when he and his fiancée, Rhonda Rauer, traveled from their home in Satellite Beach, Florida, to Jacksonville in order to attend his son's wedding. They had arrived in Jacksonville on November 22nd so they could get settled into their hotel with the puppy they had brought with them, Charlie. The following day, they left Charlie in the hotel room and went to the wedding which was at about 4 p.m. at Orange Park. They went to the reception afterwards, but left a little early so they could get back to the hotel and take their puppy for a walk. On their way, at about 7.30 p.m., they stopped by a Gate Petroleum gas station at the corner of Bay Meadows Road and Southside Boulevard, just two miles from the Sheridan Hotel where they were staying. The couple were in a good mood after leaving the happy event, and Rhonda wanted to get a bottle of wine and a bag of chips. When they pulled into the parking lot, Mike pulled his black Volkswagen Jetta into a spot immediately to the right of a red Dodge Durango. The Durango was occupied by three teenage boys, Leland Brunson, Tevin Thompson, and Jordan Davis. There was loud rap music blaring from the vehicle, so loud that the glass on Mike's Jetta was rattling. As Rhonda got out of the car, she testified that Mike said to her, quote, I hate that thug music, end quote. Rhonda said that Mike had ranted about this very subject many times, so she responded, quote, I know, end quote. Once she was in the store, Mike decided to do something about the loud music. Well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but um, got out, she's in the store, and there's like a SUV next to us, and um, then the, the music starts. Mm -hmm. And I, I rolled down my window, and uh, I thought... It was polite. I asked them nicely and demanded it. Mm -hmm. Or else I said, hey, would you guys mind turning that down? And uh, they shut it off. Mm -hmm. I was like, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
cordial. Right. Are things cordial? I put my window back up. I'm doing my stuff. And um, I don't know how many kids are in that, but mm -hmm. the, the windows are down for the back seat. Mm -hmm. The windows are up for the front seat. Okay. And um, the guy that was in the back is getting really agitated. And I, my window's up. I can't hear everything he's saying, but, you know, there's a lot of fuck him and fuck that and um, fuck that bitch. And then the music comes back on. And, you know, I'm just like, live and let live and, and you know, don't, don't need any trouble. And, and I don't know if they're singing or what, but it's like um, they're saying, kill him. So I put my window down again. And I said, excuse me, are you, are you talking about me? Um, and it was like, um, kill that bitch. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm still not reacting, but then this guy like goes down on the ground and comes up with something. I thought it was a shotgun. And he goes, you're dead, bitch, and he opens his door. Every time Mike retells this story, he always makes a point to say that he politely asked them to turn their music down. I feel like people who always have to point out one specific detail do it because it isn't true. Like people who say, true story, that's a true story, that's 100% true. He knows he started this situation off as the asshole, but needs people to think he's always the good guy. Leland Brunson testified what Mike really said. He said, can you turn the music down? I can't hear myself think. And were you looking in the driver's direction when he said that? Yes. Did anyone, um, well, let me ask you this. Do you recall whether or not the driver's um, window was up or down when he said that? It was halfway down. Did anyone turn down the music when he asked you to turn down the music? Yes. And who turned it down? Tevin. Did Jordan Davis say anything when Tevin Thompson uh, turned down the music? Yes. What was that? He said, no, turn the music back up. And who did Jordan Davis say that to? Tevin. And what did Tevin Thompson do when Jordan Davis said, turn the music back up? He turned it up a little bit, but not as loud as it was before. So his claim of being polite is bullshit. Not that he was overly aggressive, but saying, hey, could you turn that down? I can't hear myself think, still has a bit of an attitude to it. Jordan acted like a typical teenager and said, fuck that, turn it back up. At this point, according to Mike, Jordan started talking about killing him. And then, even though he was afraid for his life, he rolled the window down and asked if they were talking about him. He plays this little game where he claims he was trying to find out if they were really threatening him or if they were just singing along to music. In reality, he was pissed that Jordan was mouthing off to him, so he rolled his window down and gave him a, oh, you talking to me? Because Mike had a history of acting like a tough guy. He also claimed at this point that he saw Jordan reach down and pick up what he believed was a shotgun. He saw a straight object that looked like a barrel, so he reached into his glove box to get his gun. Quicker in a flash, I had uh, a round chambered in it, and I, I shot. Okay. Do you remember how many times you shot? Four. Okay. Okay, just keep walking me through kind of right, what you well, remember. I, I, I shot four times, and um, and that SUV pulled out, and, and like I said, I, in my mind, they got a gun. And so, you know, not training just from, I was still scared. Mm -hmm. And so I shot four more times as okay. they were fleeing. As they were fleeing? Yeah, trying to keep their heads down to not catch any return fire. Okay. The driver of the Durango, Tommy Storns, had paid for his items and returned to the vehicle while Mike and Jordan were still arguing. Once Mike started shooting, Tommy threw the SUV in reverse and backed out of the parking space before driving forward into a neighboring parking lot. Rhonda had heard the shots while paying for her wine and chips. She went outside and Mike yelled at her to get into the car. When she did, Mike pulled out of the parking lot and headed to the hotel. Rhonda asked him what happened, and he told her that he had shot at the SUV parked next to them. She asked if anyone was hurt, and he quickly told her no. Can you guys leave the gas station and route to the hotel? Mm -hmm. Does he ever describe to you any type of guns that the guys in the truck had at him? No. 
Has he ever mentioned to you that anybody in the truck had a gun? No, no, he did not. He just said they were going to, they threatened to kill him. They threatened to kill and him. And then they, so made, they made motions to advance towards him. Whatever that is. He didn't, he didn't elaborate on what that motion was. He really, was. he didn't, he wasn't specific. Mm -hmm. He just said, you know, that they, they, they were, you know, they were either coming at him or they were advancing towards him. I don't remember the words that, okay. uh, my ears were ringing at this time. Oh, okay. So, you know. <laughs> I, I've not been in this before. <laughs> but, he, but he never, and I just want to make sure we're clear, he never describes a gun that anyone in the truck had at him. No, he or didn't. any other weapon. Or any other weapon in the truck. He didn't indicate that there was a uh, weapon, no. Okay. Did he ever say anything? I know he said that they were advancing towards him. Did he say mm -hmm. anything about them getting out of the car or anything like that? Or he just left it at they were advancing? They were advancing, but when, but what from what I understood, but what he, he was saying to me was that they were starting to get out of the car. According to Rhonda, he never mentioned that they had a weapon. This becomes a major point of contention in the trial because it's Mike's biggest detail that would support self-defense. She doesn't remember him ever saying they had a weapon, though. He said, I feared for my life, is what he said first. Okay. I feared for my life. And, I, and then I said, why? What, you know, why? And he said, they threatened to kill me. Okay. So. Okay. He said that quite a bit that night. I fear for my, I fear for my life. I, I, I fear for my life. I was fearing for my life. I was fearing for my life. At this point in time, when the shooting happened, George Zimmerman was on trial for the shooting death of Trayvon Martin, where he claimed the Stand Your Ground law because he feared for his life. A detail that Mike was very familiar with because he would mention the case multiple times in letters from jail when he was on trial. I don't think it's a coincidence that the George Zimmerman trial was happening and Mike repeatedly said, quote, I feared for my life, end quote. Once back at the hotel, did Mike call the police after shooting a carload of people and fleeing the scene? Nope. Mike and Rhonda ordered pizza and went to bed. The next morning, Rhonda woke up and saw on the news that someone had died in the shooting, and she said that when she yelled to Mike, who was in the bathroom, he came out and said that he knew. So then they called the police, right? Nope. They went home. They made the two-and-a-half-hour trip south to Satellite Beach. Both Mike and Rhonda said that they were concerned about their dog and wanted to make sure they got him home and he was taken care of. Then they'd contact their local police. I love dogs, and every dog we've ever had has been pretty spoiled. But it's a dog. Your biggest concern after shooting and killing someone is your dog? Leave him at the hotel, find a kennel, drop him off with family members, bring him to the police station with you. There are so many options that aren't driving two and a half hours away from the scene. Supposedly, Mike also wanted to consult his neighbor. Our neighbor just down the way is a real good friend of ours, and he's in the government in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, well, he's in law enforcement. I don't know which branch. Right. Um, but we were going to go, you know talk to him and, mm -hmm. and like do you do you do you know anybody in the sheriff's department that we could talk to because you know I didn't I didn't want it to happen the way it did the way it did is sheriff came with AR-15s and yeah because you shot and killed someone then fled the scene you fucking dope and what is it with the search for a specific sheriff to talk to he wanted to wait until he got home so he could talk to law enforcement where he lives. And then he wanted to wait and talk to his neighbor to see if there was a specific sheriff he could talk to. Why? Does he think there'll be a different outcome? He's making excuses for why he fled and then why he didn't go to the police in his area right away. If they never identified him, he would have never come forward. It turned out that someone else at the gas station had written his license plate number down. If that hadn't happened, Mike would have driven home and told Rhonda to keep her mouth shut. After Mike was caught and the case got picked up by the media, one of Mike's previous neighbors, Charles Hendricks, was interviewed. He had lived next door to Mike in Port St. Lucie for about eight years. He had a really arrogant attitude about him, like he was smarter than everybody else. Um, I found that not only annoying, but quite amusing, because I didn't find him as near as intelligent as he thought he was. Um, he knew about computers, but he didn't appear to know a lot about uh, interpersonal relationships and how to get along with people. That was just my perception. Um, he had an air where he was light and friendly and he laughed, but uh, 
if you disagreed with him, he would get boisterous and try to be overbearing and try to intimidate people with his size and his voice. And uh, He appeared to me to be very selfish and that, that there wasn't much that he wouldn't do to get what he wanted or get his way. Very arrogant. In the interview, he told stories about two of Mike's previous wives, both having come to his house afraid of Mike. They both said Mike had threatened them by holding a gun to their heads. Both of them were immigrants and said that Mike would frequently get his way by threatening to have them deported and to have their children taken away. He went on to say that Mike was eager to use his gun. Did I ever hear him say that he wanted to shoot somebody? Not directly, but there were several times where he made comments that I can't wait for somebody to try something with me when I have my gun. I'm the type of person that's the last thing I want to be contemplating. You know, I don't want to have a confrontation with somebody while I have a gun. Anybody that does, um, they're predisposed, in my opinion, to kill somebody. If you're looking for a confrontation just because you have a gun, there, there's no question in my mind that people that are looking for problems when they have a gun, someday are going to find it. And... When I heard about this incident with Michael Dunn, I said, there you go. I knew it. Sooner or later, he's going to kill somebody. I had said that to my wife. I had said it to my daughter. Uh, sooner or later, this guy is going to kill somebody. He thinks that a gun makes him safe and makes him all powerful. And that was the attitude that he had when he talked about his gun. Uh, it was like it was his best friend and that he could overcome the world with his freaking 9 millimeter. The mentality just... His mentality towards guns didn't correlate with his intellect when it came to computers. It was like, what's wrong with this guy? That was the real Michael Dunn. But when he was arrested, he acted like the nice guy who had politely asked to have the music turned down, and in return, he had to defend himself. He told police that Jordan threatened to kill him, and he saw a shotgun, so he was clearly defending himself. I'll be the first to tell you there's no weapons in that car. I don't know what you saw. That's the possible and they drove off, they dumped it. They never left the parking lot. Yeah, they drove out, circled right back around and came right back to that spot. Oh, okay, because they circled around until they saw you leave and then they drove right back. Because they saw you right. leave at that so point. So you leave and they realized their friend had been hit. So they never left the parking lot. They came right back at that point. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. My story's falling apart. He already knew there wasn't a weapon in that car. As soon as detectives say there was no weapon, Mike is ready with the idea that they tossed it. He's already thought this out. He came up with the idea that they had a shotgun later, since he never mentioned the gun to Rhonda at any point between the shooting and when they got home. He thought, oh, I'll claim they had a gun. When they say there was no gun in the Durango, it'll be easy to say they just tossed it after they drove away. He didn't know that they had just pulled into the next parking lot over in the same complex and then came right back after they saw him leave. Let's pretend for a minute that Mike believed he needed to shoot at Jordan to defend his life. He's so paranoid that he's imagining that people have weapons when they don't. Maybe this isn't the type of person we want walking around with a gun. But the truth is, he didn't fear for his life and his story backs that up. Once again, if you think they have something... Think they have a shotgun? They yeah, have a shotgun. You think they have a shotgun? Are you gonna get out of your car so they can get a good, good aim on you? Make any sense? Well, at the time, I was doing everything on adrenaline and no. Well, I'm just saying that we're trained to, if we think something is there, to get out of the way to get out of the way, cover or concealment. So you're telling me that you thought they had a shotgun, but you got out of your car so they would get a good aim at you. Is what you're telling me? Well, I thought maybe they would shoot out the car and I wouldn't be in it. But so the car, your car is not shooting at them. You are. Why yeah, are they shooting at your car? Yeah, they can't. So, uh, honestly, sir, I'm um, at a loss to, to justify what I did on the second volley. Right. Other than to say I, I thought they were shooting, going to be shooting back, and I was keeping them from doing that. 
you got out of the car into the open so that you wouldn't be in the car on the off chance that they shot at the car? What the fuck are you talking about? No, you engaged them, and then when they tried to flee your attack, you advanced towards them. That is not someone who's afraid. Mike had told police that when he got back to the hotel, he was afraid that a red Durango was going to show up and attack him out of retaliation. But when they talked to Rhonda, she said he didn't seem scared. Michael said something in the interview that was kind of... Uh, he made a comment that you guys went back to the room and he was basically waiting on some thugs with guns to come to the room at any given time. When you guys got back to the hotel, did he take the car, the gun out of the glove box and take it up to the room with you guys? No, I don't think so. Okay. okay, so you left it in the car? I do believe so. Okay. And then you go up to the room and he gets the dog and goes outside and walks the dog. So he's so comfortable that even he'll go back outside and walk again without the gun with the dog. There was no way that Mike ever thought that anyone was going to show up at that hotel. He never acted like that, and he never said anything about that to Rhonda. If he believed that people were going to come and attack him at the hotel, wouldn't he warn his fiance? Wouldn't he suggest leaving the hotel? It's another fabrication he came up with later to make it sound like he was afraid for his life. Michael Dunn was charged with one count of first-degree murder, three counts of attempted murder, and one count of firing into an occupied vehicle. During his trial, Mike insisted that the case had nothing to do with race, but he continually wrote to his family members and made statements like this, quote, This jail is full of blacks, and they all act like thugs. This may sound a bit radical, but if more people would arm themselves and kill these fucking idiots when they're threatening you, eventually they may take the hint and change their behavior. End quote. He was recorded during a call to Rhonda saying this, quote, They're like freaking out because a white guy dared to ask him to turn down their, I mean, you know, come on. If you ask me to turn down my music, I'm going to kill you. And if you tell me to mind my own business, I mean, Jesus Christ, you know, no wonder people are afraid to tell them to pick up their pants. And all I can think is that it's the culture, the MTV culture and the gangster rap, and where are their dads, end quote. Well, since he asked, Jordan's dad, Ron Davis, was right there at home. His parents had been divorced, but his dad was always in his life. Jordan was born on February 16th, 1995, to Ron Davis and Lucy McBath. They considered him a miracle baby, since Ron and Lucy believed they would never be able to have children due to a procedure that Lucy had that removed part of her uterus. After his parents divorced, he spent time going back and forth between Atlanta, Georgia, where his mother lived, and Jacksonville, Florida, where his father lived. Since Lucy worked for Delta Airlines, Jordan was able to take advantage of the free flights to ensure he had equal time with his parents. Just before Jordan's 16th birthday, he moved in with his father because Lucy was suffering from breast cancer. He wasn't happy about leaving his friends in Atlanta, but eventually he fell in love with the beach and made new friends in Jacksonville. He spent his days as an average suburban teenager, hanging out with friends, picking up girls, and playing basketball and video games. People at his high school said he could be mouthy, but not anything abnormal for a teenager. The problem is that Mike assumed that every black teenager was a thug who had been abandoned by their father, but that wasn't true. And then Mike doubled down by writing all over the walls in his jail cell. He wrote, quote, The thug life is no way to live, end quote. And also, quote, not all liars are thugs, but all thugs are liars, end quote. He also drew a picture of a sign that had the word thugs in the middle, in a circle with a line through it. At trial, Mike's defense tried to prove that he had acted in self-defense, claiming he was in fear for his life because Jordan had a gun and was getting out of the Durango to kill him. But the evidence just proved otherwise. Not only was there no weapon, but there were witnesses at the gas station. Stephen Smith was a building contractor who had gotten done at a job site just down the street and stopped into the gas station to pick up something to drink. He said when he pulled into the parking lot, he saw the Durango and heard the music, so instead of taking the open spot right next to it, he pulled over to a spot further away. So, you know, he acted like a reasonable adult. He got his drink and even made a comment to the cashier about the loud music. I asked her, I said, I wish they'd turn that out. It's my favorite song. Okay. Being a smart aleck. As he left the store, he got just outside when the shooting happened. I was about to make a turn and walk towards my truck door. And what stopped you? 
I heard someone yell or someone say something very loud. And what did you hear that person say? No, you're not going to talk to me that way. All right. Can you use your voice to try to convey to the jury the volume of that person's voice? You're not going to talk to me that way. Was it a male voice or a female voice? Male. And could you tell where that voice was coming from? The direction it was coming from was the, the park Jetta. Okay. And the windows, I believe you said, on the red Dodge Durango were down? On the passenger side they were, yes, ma'am. Did you hear any voices projected towards you over the Jetta? No, ma'am, I didn't. You're not going to talk to me that way. Is that the statement of someone who's in fear for their life? It kind of sounds like someone who's pissed off that someone's defying them. Maybe, like the neighbor described, an arrogant man who always needed to have his way. Of course, the prosecutor clarified that nobody threatened Mike. When you heard what you believe to be the occupant of the Jetta say those words, did you ever hear anyone in the red car say anything back to him? No, ma'am, I didn't. Okay. Did you ever see anyone in the red Dodge Durango brandish any sort of weapon? No, ma'am, I didn't. Any stick? No, ma'am, I didn't. Any cylindrical object? No, ma'am, I didn't. Any knife? No, ma'am. Mike was not threatened by anyone in that vehicle that day. They disrespected him and he couldn't handle it, so he pulled out his gun and showed those kids who was boss. Then, as they pulled away, he exited his vehicle and advanced towards them and continued shooting. Either that, or for some unknown reason, Stephen Smith is lying about what he saw. If Mike is to be believed, this guy has completely fabricated this story. For no apparent reason, he has completely lied in order to make Mike out to be a murderer. Stephen just randomly thought, fuck this Michael Dunn guy, he's going down. Then of course the other teens in the Durango were lying, but what about his own fiance? She said he never mentioned a gun, but he claimed she was mistaken. He claimed that he told her multiple times that they had a gun, but she just can't seem to remember a single one of them. Then, there was no gun found in the Durango. But of course, this was just because the police were too incompetent to search well enough. Let's, um, let's talk about what this, uh, what you saw was. As you sit mm -hmm. here today, what is, what is it now? It was a shotgun. It's a shotgun. Okay, what did you tell the sheriff's office it was? I told him it was a shotgun. Didn't you tell him it was, uh, either a barrel or a stick? Yes, I did. And this is after the police telling me there is no weapon recovered at the car or the scene and me believing the police are competent and able to search the whole area. So by process of elimination, um, you know, it's like some kind of industrial object, a pipe, something that looked very much like a barrel. But at the time, his actions and his threats, there was no no doubt in my mind that that was a weapon, that that was a firearm. But, but um, the doubt came in when the police started telling me that they didn't recover anything in the car or the scene. But as we've learned, they didn't check the scene. And um, when you said yeah. at that time it, it could have been a stick? Yeah, and again, two hours of sleep, I, I misspoke. I mean, a stick doesn't really do justice to it. Um, Picture anything that looks like a barrel, something with a metal patina, right around the same um, thickness of, of a shotgun barrel. And isn't it true that the detective said at some point, is it possible it was your imagination? And you said yes. No, I did not. I started to say that anything is possible. He claimed that he only said that the shotgun might have been a stick after they told him that there was no weapon in the Durango. But I decided to recheck that. For those who are watching on video, make sure you pay attention to the timestamp. When you began to shoot, can you honestly tell us that you ever saw a gun inside that vehicle? I saw a barrel come up on the window, like a like a uh, single shot shotgun where there's a barrel. Mm -hmm. I didn't see this part of the barrel, I saw that part of the barrel. And it was either a barrel or a stick. I'll be the first to tell you there's no weapons in the car. I don't know what you saw. That's the possible when they drove off, they dumped it. They never left the parking lot. Yeah, they drove out, circled right back around, and came right back to that spot. Oh, okay, because they circled around until they saw you leave, and then they drove right back. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, it's 4.18 p.m. when Mike says, quote, it was either a barrel or a stick, end quote. Then, 
Two minutes later, at 4.20 p.m., they tell him for the first time that they found no weapons in the Durango. Michael Dunn is full of shit. He's constantly adjusting his story to try to explain away the inconsistencies in his statement, because he thinks he's smarter than everyone, but he isn't. The prosecutor also tried to understand exactly how Jordan would have been able to get out of the Durango. He did open the door. Yep, he popped it open okay. a little, and then he opened it all the way. Well, you know, most of the way. And um, can you show the jury on States 125 where the, the ding is in your door? I don't where this think, I don't think he hit me. The door? I don't think it hit me. So the, the guy who's enraged next to you is, uh, opens the door and doesn't hit your car? Apparently not. But if you look at the rear of uh, Durango, it's by the wheel well, and their door isn't, it isn't like a sedan where, they're, um, where they would hit you. It's a little high. And tell the jury how close the two cars were. They were pretty close. How close? I couldn't tell you feet-wise, but I know uh, the Durango is parked close to the white line separating our two spots. Well, well you put that fact in your letter too, didn't you? I did. Okay, and what you said in your letter was there was a red SUV to the left that was parked too close to the right of its space for me to exit my car. Correct. So you couldn't open your door, right? I could, but it wouldn't have been comfortable. Okay, but he can open his door in a rage and not hit your car. Um, obviously, uh, because that's what happened. So Mike couldn't open his door far enough to be able to get out comfortably, but Jordan opened the door almost all the way? Mike is so dead set on trying to claim he was in fear for his life that when the prosecutor asks him about being afraid when he got back to the hotel, he makes this statement. That, that you, were, you spent the time looking down, waiting for the red SUV to come back. Is that what yeah, you it was like a waking nightmare. Get the fuck out of here. You bully and murder a teenager, and then you have the nerve to claim that the time period afterwards was a waking nightmare for you? This would be the same time period that Jordan's parents were finding out their son is dead. This would be the same time period that Jordan's girlfriend is finding out that her boyfriend is dead. This is the same time period that Leland, Tevin, and Tommy are dealing with the fact that they just watched their friend get shot to death right in front of them and were nearly killed themselves. But this was your waking nightmare? So that you can try to get away with a crime claiming self-defense? Go fuck yourself. Michael Dunn was found guilty of the three charges of attempted murder and the charge of firing into an occupied vehicle, but the jury couldn't reach a verdict on the murder charge. The reason they were able to come to a decision on the attempted murder charges was because Mike specifically argued that Jordan had a gun, Jordan threatened to kill him, and Jordan got out of the vehicle. Mike's self-defense claim was against Jordan. The jury specifically asked the judge if the self-defense claim covered everyone or if it applied individually, and the judge told them it applied individually. Since the jury heard no details that the other three occupants of the Durango were a threat to Mike, his attempt to murder them was unjustified, something that I don't believe Mike thought through when he was planning out his lame attempt at a self-defense claim, because again, he's not as smart as he thinks he is. He fired 10 rounds at a vehicle, and based on where the shots hit, he could have killed anyone in that vehicle. He nearly missed Tommy, who wasn't even there during most of the altercation. The case was retried, and this time the jury found Michael Dunn guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life without parole. If he had been acquitted for the murder charge, he would have faced 75 years in prison for the other charges, something that, at his age, would likely also be a life sentence. He filed for appeal twice, and both times it was denied by the Supreme Court. I believe that Michael Dunn believes he's in the right. I think he believes he was being threatened now. I don't believe he shot at the Durango out of self-defense in any way at the time. I believe he was pissed off because some young punk had mouthed off to him, and he was so angry that he was going to show them who was boss. Then you replace the word punk with black, and that was the thing that really set Mike over the top. Once he had fled and had a day to think about it, in his head it became about protecting himself and his fiancée from this group of dangerous thugs. Thugs that he himself wrote that more people should kill. I think that Mike has now fully convinced himself that he killed Jordan in self-defense and believes he's been wrongfully convicted. Fortunately, enough other people, including the prosecutor and the jury, were able to see Michael Dunn for what he truly is. 
not the poor innocent victim that he proclaims himself to be, but a monster. There won't be a second episode this week as I'll be out of town for Thanksgiving, but I wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving, or just have a good day if you don't celebrate it. Be safe. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.